Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is February 26, 2013, and my guest is Lee Steinberg, legendary sports agent. Lee, welcome to Econ Talk. My pleasure to be here. Uh, how'd you get started in the business? It's a very competitive business that I think a lot of young people aspire to without thinking too much about how hard it is to get that first client. How did that happen for you? I was living in the dorms as a dorm counselor at UC Berkeley, going to law school in uh, the early 70s, and they moved a freshman football team into the dorm, and one of my counselees was Steve Bartkowski who in 1975 went on to be the very first selection in the NFL draft, the first pick in the first round, uh, picked by the Atlanta Falcons. And I had uh, graduated and then traveled for a year. Um, When I got to Egypt, I jumped into the Nile River, only to find out later there were about 111 diseases endemic to the (laughs) Nile River. And so I had a long stay in London at uh, a hospital and couldn't take the jobs as a district attorney or as a corporate litigator that were offered. So what happened was that Steve had been drafted and the draft was in January at that point, and he asked me to represent him. Well, there I was, brimming with legal experience, never having uh, practiced law before, and I had the very first pick in the first round. The World Football League was competing against the NFL at that time, teams that I know live in your memory, like the Shreveport Steamer and the uh, Chicago Wind, which then became the Chicago Fire. And we were able to negotiate the largest rookie contract in NFL history, which eclipsed uh, Joe Namath and O.J. Simpson, who were the previous standard bearers. And so we were going to fly into Atlanta to sign the contract the next day, and we get to the airport, and there are Klieg lights flashing in the sky. A huge crowd is pressed up against the police line, and the first thing we heard we saw these Klee lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. Hmm. And the first thing we heard was we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and his attorney, Lee Steinberg have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. Well, how old were you? How old were you? (laughs) I was 25. Uh And so I looked at Steve, probably the way that Dorothy looked at Toto when they got to Munchkin land and said, I guess we're not in Berkeley anymore because I, I finally saw for the very first time, the tremendous idol worship and veneration that athletes are held in across the country, how they were the movie stars and they were the celebrities. Um, so I thought the major challenge at that time was how to, find a way to incorporate underlying beliefs and admonitions to uh, make a difference in the world in a career. And I saw then that athletes could serve as role models and trigger imitative behavior and make a profound impact on the times. Yeah, I, I want we're going to get into all that, but I, I was still want to stick with the, some of the nitty gritty of, of starting a, a, a shop where – you know, one athlete's fabulous that you happen to room with near Steve Bartkowski is lovely. And he just happened to be the first pick in the draft. That was fabulous. It just happened to be a year when there was a lot of competition, which meant it was a tremendous salary and you had to do a good job, sure. Uh, but you had to go on from there. And how did you well, proceed? I had, uh, 
Well, I had glorious offices. Um, I operated out of the card room in my parents' home in West Los Angeles. <laughs> um, at that time, and I'm sure none of the younger listeners will recall such a time, um, there was a rotary phone, and um, if you dialed it, and I was on the phone, it actually ran busy. Um, I was my own secretary. I went in and Xeroxed things at Kinko's Copies and uh, typed on my electric typewriter. And uh, that that was the situation for a number of years. I had uh, no staff and, and no help. And f- until 1981, I didn't even uh, get a secretary. But um, I bought a home in Berkeley in 1979 and then in 81 added a secretary. But all business was personal then. Um, there were no cell phones, so uh, phone booths became temporary offices everywhere. And uh, with with a roll of quarters or a uh, number to charge those calls to. Well, for our, and, for our younger listeners, a phone booth is a place that used to be on a street corner <laughs> or a wall of a building – or you could actually make a telephone call by depositing coins into a slot, uh, right? It's there aren't there aren't would, any anymore. They, they yeah, don't exist. It, 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 the problem is that uh, Superman always changed in phone booths, so he's now cooked. he's cooked. He he'd be in 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 real trouble. So seriously, though, it, you had this unimaginable, literally unimaginable success, uh, and and I. Anyone who says that econ talk is not practical now knows something very valuable about the Nile River. So you go from this hospital to incredible professional success. How'd you get client number two? Did you? Well, that was are you knocking rug. on doors? Are you calling friends of friends of friends? Are you hanging out in certain places? How did that the happen? Truth, the truth is that I made a series of mistakes that next year. My next client was Dave Hampton, who happened to be an all-pro running back, who was a teammate of, uh, of Bartkowski. And then Pat McAnally, who was a wide receiver punter who had, had played with Steve um, with the Cincinnati Bengals. He'd played in the All-Star Games. But at that point, I had no methodology because – I hadn't really tried to get a first client, so I had to relearn an entire business, and I made a lot of mistakes. Um, the first year, I thought, well, I'll send a series of people to all-star games, and we'll meet college seniors as they get ready to graduate and be able to represent them in the draft. Same reason. But I, but I spent um, way too much money, and... Um, and quickly found that notwithstanding the fact that, that Bartkowski was bringing great revenue, that one player was an activity center that could spawn endorsements, uh, financial planning for someone, not me, um, and, and tremendous activity, which is a cardinal rule is that one key critical cutting edge client, uh, spawns more activity than, than, uh, many, 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 uh, average clients. But I'd spent all that money and my dad came to me at one point and said, you know what? I'm a high school principal and you've gone through all my credit cards <laughs> and I, I can't uh-huh. advance you anymore. So uh-huh. <laughs> Steve Bartkowski in early 1977, uh, uh, bought me a plane ticket. I flew to Atlanta. Um, there was a player named Joel Cowboy Parrish, who was an offensive guard from the University of Georgia, who was going to sign in the Canadian Football League. And Steve rented me a car, and I drove down to Douglas, Georgia, in what then was the deep rural south, and signed this player. And he then signed in Canada prior to the NFL draft, and I was able to survive. And what I learned was that there was a profile of the type of player that I might attract, someone who was interested in being a role model, retracing their roots, who saw sports as a springboard, and that if that was the type of player I was talking to, I had a real chance for great success. 
anyone outside of that profile who looked at all the social engineering I was doing and the loftier goals would not be interested necessarily, and I'd have a very, very low chance of uh, signing that player. So I developed a methodology that focused on a certain type of player who I could research, who I could figure out from interviews and and parental structure was going to fit. And I also came up with the concept of regionality, which is that it costs so much money to fly around uh, and to fly athletes in from across the country. So what made sense to me was to try to dominate Southern California because I could get to schools like UCLA and SC and with a little extension to Cal and Stanford and um, That's a pretty Arizona. Fertile, pretty fertile Arizona. area. Well, we're a little country, but the point is, is that instead of traveling everywhere, I made sure to focus on those athletes and those athletes at the very top of the draft. And I also recognized quickly that in football, the straw that stirred the drink was the quarterback position yep, and that that, play, that player had many, many multiples more um of uh, name recognition and endorsement potential and 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 higher contracts so i ought to concentrate on that position and when i did those things the practice grew built uh, rapidly now you mentioned your desire to work with your clients to towards some idealistic goals and in, in that sense you you developed a brand an identity for yourself that made you stick out. Um, what was your involvement with the movie Jerry Maguire, which captures a a similar theme, an agent who um, wants to go against the grain and do things a little differently? And I know you were involved with that movie, so talk about that. Uh, the director of the film, who also wrote it, Cameron Crowe, called me up in 90, 1993 and asked if, he could follow me around, be a fly on the wall, uh, wall to pick up atmosphere, stories, and the whole milieu of uh, the sports agency. So he had done a movie called Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which I thought was hilarious. So I agreed, and he went with me to the 1993 league meetings where all the teams assemble and walked around listened to conversations, saw the people was uh, uh, ensconced in it. Um, and that's a place where we took free agents to try to players who didn't have uh, uh, current contracts to show them off to teams. So he saw all that. Then I took him back to the draft in 93 where I had Drew Bledsoe, who was the first player picked. And he watched that process, and I would tell him stories. What was your greatest fear on draft day? Well, it would be um, if, in reality, Drew Bledsoe was signing with someone else, and I woke up the next morning to find uh, that I didn't have that player. Um, and and then he came up when we met with uh, Bill Parcells and did the press conference. He came to pro scouting days at uh, USC to – uh, Super Bowl parties to a number of games, and all the while I kept telling him stories about uh, things I had done or heard or seen. And so we went off and wrote the script. My next role was to vet the script so that the willing suspension of disbelief was um, not broken there. That's what's necessary to yep. make sure you don't think the film is a spoof or unrealistic and stop focusing. Um, then I worked with the actors. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. down with me to the Super Bowl in Arizona and made him pretend he was a wide receiver for the whole week. Um, and how did you uh, do? He was great. There was one time where Cameron said, "Now look, he's an actor. These athletes are heavy drinkers. Make sure that he's not, you know, somehow impaired." So came a time when we're all late at night at a bar and every athlete is passed out and as the whole world is uh, running down and, and Cuba's up on the bar uh, tap dancing. So I'd like to see um, that video. <laughs> <clears throat> so at any rate, um, 
and and I spent time with the with uh, Tom Cruise and Regina King and and uh, I had to show Jerry O'Connell who played the foot, uh, quarterback in the film how to throw a football because he was from NYU and they didn't have football there. And that would hurt the willing suspension of disbelief, wouldn't it? <laughs> right? It just, doesn't uh, grip it right. Can't throw a spiral. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, the, the, and then we cast athletes in the film, which helped make it a big success. Yeah. It Bledsoe's in it. I remember. There were Troy Aikman yep. and, and Warren Moon and, and, uh, uh, a whole series of players were in that film. And, um, and it, and it helped the open because it could be covered on the sports page as, as well as the, entertainment section and then that led to working with Oliver Stone on any given Sunday and Sam Raimi on for the love of the game. Uh it must have been uh must have been a lot of fun. Uh incredible adventure. How about the um the actual character Jerry Maguire? Do you see yourself there? Is, they, they say <laughs> some people say that's that's you. Is it you? Part of you? Well little you Cam- Cameron you <laughs> Cameron used to say that Jerry Maguire aspired to be Lee Steinberg. <laughs> and uh, that's so, th- so uh, that's not my uh, total arc. Uh, so it's not uh, strictly biographical, but there's a whole lot of stories that I told and things that happened that, uh, that show up in various ways on the screen. Uh, let me ask you a technical question about the, the business. Uh, do all agents earn the same commission from their clients? Is it roughly the same? Is there a lot of variation? How does that actually work? The players associations set the maximum fee that can be uh, earned by an agent. So in football, it's 3% of the contract as the money comes to the players. In basketball, it's now salary cap, so the formula for a rookie is 4% of the differential between 80 and 120% of what that slot in the draft er, uh, uh, made over the last three years. So it's only the overage that you can bill on. You can bill later veterans 4%. And in baseball, it tends to be more like 5%. Now, those are figures for contract negotiations. In endorsements, there are no such regulations, and the norm tends to be 15 to 20% of the gross size of the compensation. And of course, for a Troy Aikman, the endorsement is going to be a lot higher than a punter, uh, the endorsement part of that deal, right? Well, the the reality of the situation is, is that if one is careful – and builds brand first so that the athlete is able to time his breakthrough in the sport with when he signs those endorsements, they could be substantial. So uh, for clients of ours like Steve Young and Troy Aikman, who between them won four straight Super Bowls, that was a great endorsement market. Or Ben Roethlisberger, who came right into the league and won his uh, first 14 games. And then different sports are different. I marketed Lennox Lewis for a series of years in Oscar de la Hoya. And again, those my focus – uh, each of them were the were the champion of their weight class, and the key in each of those situations was to try to actually get them to start to be their own promoter. So that instead of paying a promoter forty percent, they were empowered to run their own organization, of which they were the key. So in both those cases, um, I pushed the athlete to take more charge over his own life and become the captain of a ship. Now, when you have a an athlete who is – you have a client who – you often have the client before you know exactly where their draft is going to be in football, right? Yes. Right? You don't – typically a player in college doesn't get his agent after the draft, although I'm sure some do. They fire him and et cetera. But most of the time – you're not sure who's going to be number one. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, but you're not sure. And when that comes through, though, when according to Wikipedia, eight times you've represented the number one overall pick in the draft, uh, that's probably pretty exhilarating. Um, what's 
that experience like when you have the number one player in the draft with a GM who, quote, has to sign that eight, that player? It's not literally true, of course. As an economist, we know that's not true. But has a pressure to sign that player. What What is that negotiation like? And is it different every time or does it kind of have a similar pattern? Is it fun? Is it scary? Did it get easier? Mm-hmm. Tell us – talk about that. Depends how the timing of that pick works out. The team with the very top player, for example, in the NFL, can sign that player and therefore draft him any time after the Pro Bowl. And then if they were to do that, then the number two team could do the same thing. So if a team has locked in and made a choice prior, then that negotiation takes place prior. One of the dynamics is that The team can use the leverage of saying, as they did in 1989 with uh, Troy Aikman, um, look, if you don't take the package we're offering, then we're just going to go ahead and and pick um, Tony Mandarich. We'll pick someone else and you won't be the first pick. Um, So you have to get into each player's psyche to have them – tell you what their real value system is and and what their priorities are. You know, how important is it to be the number one pick? How important is it to sign the biggest contract of all time? How important is it to be with a, with a given team or a coach? Each player will be different. Um, In most of those cases, uh, the, the the pick's pretty obvious. Um, So, in the case of uh, Troy Aikman, I negotiated the uh, contract prior to the draft, or Jeff George or Russell Maryland. Um, uh, George was with Indianapolis, and the other two were with Dallas. Um, in other cases, the team go ahead, goes ahead and commits into the pick without signing them. And in that case, the leverage is very heavily on the side of the player. Remember, the whole thing is an artificial construct because at the end of the day, whatever the team offers a rookie who's been sitting on a college campus living yeah. on scholarship money yeah. is going to be change. Is, is going to be massively more than what he could earn, uh, for example, uh, uh, going back to campus for an additional year and uh, – and developing the new theory of super collider research or yeah. playing cello in the Philharmonic. So the, uh, the, there's a balanced dynamic. The other side of the equation is that <clears throat> if a team, having publicly committed to the player, was not able to sign him um, in timely fashion, it incurs the wrath of fans, but moreover spoils the chance that the player has a really season. making impact yeah. in the first year. Absolutely. So that's so that's the dynamic. In almost every case, that situation is the most exhilarating type of negotiation other than free agency. It is exciting. Um in seven cases, uh I had the second pick in the draft and some of those, like nineteen ninety nine Akili Smith and Tim Couch were both possibilities for the first pick of the Cleveland Browns. And we didn't know all night long. They were negotiating with both of us who would pick. And ultimately, Couch got picked first and, and Smith went to Cincinnati on the third pick. But um, it's exhilarating. It's sitting on the cutting edge of, uh, of uh, football. And the draft itself, of course, is is massively exciting because – it's all the dreams and hopes of an extended family and a coaching group at the collegiate level and everyone who's ever been close to the athlete all rolled into a uh, uh, mo- Christmas morning type of experience. There's going to be some wonderful present under, but you don't know. Sitting there waiting for the draft, if you haven't accurately prognosticated where the player is going to do, is agonizing because national TV cameras are close to the face of uh, yeah. the player and the family members. And it's not real time. It's like Chinese water torture time. Every second seems like a minute. Every minute seems like an hour. And uh, it, 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 it really is important for me to prepare a player well. I'm curious about 
when you interact with a general manager, of course, there are many you interact with year in, year out. You, you get to know them. You know what their style is. Uh, others, maybe one time they either get fired or you just don't happen to have a client who works – who's been drafted by that general manager. But talk about the different styles and, and what they – would that – would some of them drive you crazy? Would some of them be kind of easy to work with or are they all fairly similar? No, they're not fairly similar. They have disparate uh, personalities, backgrounds. Um, when I began, everyone who negotiated, first of all, there was no right of representation. So for the first couple of years, a team could just hang the phone up and say they didn't deal with agents. But then the um, most of the general managers <clears throat> had either played the sport coach the sport, were somehow involved, and so their backgrounds weren't primarily business. Now, that evolved over time, and people whose backgrounds were law school and business school came into it, so then at that point, it was more like speaking uh, to peers. Um, the old guard especially was very, very uh, reticent to allow an agent to talk about player talent. Um, and would bristle and really didn't love the whole concept of representation in the first place. It just was at odds with what they'd experienced. But over time, um, that group became more mixed and had many people with business professionals who could um, didn't resent the process at all, as a matter of fact, appreciated agents, um, because it insulated them from having to deal directly with players or their parents who could be much less businesslike and much more passionate. <clears throat> sure. Remember the first, first time I ever told Steve Bartkowski, I said, Steve, I'm going to negotiate for you. And after each session, it's your life. So you're certainly entitled to hear whatever it is that you want to hear from the session. I can give you the bottom line or I can give you the blow by blow. Oh no, Lee, I want to hear everything. You know, it's, it's all about me and I'd, I'd like to hear it. So when I went back to him and said, Steve, um, we haven't made much progress today. Well, why? Um, what did the team say about me? What now you really want to hear? Yes. Well, they said that it was a poor quarterback year and they picked you because you were the bench best of a bad bunch. And, uh, you've got questionable knees. They don't know about your mobility or about the length of your career. What? What, Lee? I never want to play for that team again. So there's a well, that's need. That's exactly what the value of an agent is. You're, you can hate your agent. The, the owner can, the GM can hate the agent so, instead of the player. So, <laughs> So, so, um, but the reality is we're in a closed system and the only thing that sure is the same, uh, people are going to negotiate over and over and over again. So it keeps things civil. Um, I'm always aware that that's not the last negotiation I'm ever going to do with the, with the person I'm doing, even right. for that player. Yeah. And so the key is not to stick your foot on someone's neck when it's exposed, not to put them in an embarrassing situation. The key to negotiating is putting yourself in the other person's heart and mind, seeing the world the way they see it, having carefully researched what their pressures are, what their economics are, and creating and crafting a win-win situation. There's one more thing. I've always had a different theory about this and most people represent athletes. I don't think the real battle should be labor versus management for a sport like football or baseball or basketball. The real battle is with the NBA and the NHL and home box office and Walt Disney World and every other form of discretionary entertainment yep, spending. YouTube. So what we're really doing is competing with um Every other form of entertainment in the world, every other way that people can spend money. So the proper role is to build the brand. So if I'm ever doing an acrimonious individual negotiation that spills into the press, it's going to push fans away from the sport and I'm going to hurt the player and his image and I'm going to hurt uh, the, the, every other part of it to ever have a long-term acrimonious um, collective bargaining agreement where time is missed 
is self-destructive. The reality is, is that together, I would talk to owners about the fact we should work together to to explode television revenue, to think of new concepts like the NFL network or direct TV or uh, uh, fantasy sports or how we can use social media and the internet or, uh, you know, massive scoreboards. I mean, our goal is to build a pie large enough that we won't be uh, so worried about, um, incremental dollars. And so that's been my approach. I think of owners, except in the limited case where we're negotiating, as allies, and we've got a job together. Part of it is conceptualizing the role of an agent as being a steward of the sport, as opposed to simply just stacking one more dollar in in the short term in, in bank books. But of course, I mean, that's great economics, by the way. Wonderful in the real sense of the word, not just the financial side of football. It's just a great insight into the fact that people can substitute activities and what really competes with what. I, that's great stuff. But, of course, ego plays a role, and it, it's such a um, uh, a small group of men, the owners, the GMs, and then the players. Um, and they're they're really remarkably unusual people, the coaches and, and and GMs in their own way. They don't have the talent of the athletes, <clears throat> but they are at the top of a very small pyramid, and um, their intensity must be something else. Well, the mentality of billionaires is something else because uh, these are men who, by and large, made their fortune in the rough-and-tumble free enterprise system doing things that people told them weren't possible to do. And so I, you now catch them at a point where they've aggregated enough revenue to be able to afford the monstrous uh, franchise price. And so these are major successes in another field who are generally elevated uh, in age. So the key is to, again, see the world the way that they see it. And if I can help bring them role model players who enhance the uh, ability of the team to market and generate revenue and ultimately enhance the franchise value, then there's a, there's a consanguinity of goals. There's, uh, that, that we can work towards. And so the, the goal is to see the needs of an owner and to understand their position. And again, to bring them the type of player who they can rely on on the field, who uh, will be a credit to their franchise, and together to to create an environment where we're not pushing away fans, we're not destroying um, the the ability of of someone making forty thousand dollars a year to relate to the whole thing, um, but we're carefully trying to be as creative as possible to develop every ancillary revenue uh, flow um, and and be creative and, and, and develop the next great thing. So I've got the need to think about it as a business and where the revenue comes from because ultimately if the revenue is there, my clients will get paid. And if owners are ever experiencing an economic difficulty, they won't. Let's talk about your relationship with your with the athletes, with your clients. You talked earlier about sitting down with them, trying to understand what they care about, what city they might want to live in, their relationship with the coach. How how much did you, do you get involved with their lives, um, with their problems, with their crises? These are, as you said, 20, 22-year-old kids, young men thrown into an, a world they've never experienced before. There's health issues. There's public image, there's their training. What role do you play in the, in their, in those experiences? <clears throat> Pretty central with a younger athlete <clears throat> who, as you said, is just making the transition. So one of the first things we do is try to make sure they've got a teaching component and a safety net for financial planning, which is a service that that I think should be done in a separate way so they have another person in their life 
who will educate them, teach them the basics of, uh, of uh, how to live a financial life, um, and protect them from from pitfalls and and dangers. Then a part of it's preparing. As I said, the key is to really understand and know a given client. How do they look at short-term economic gain and long-term economic security and family and geographical location and profile and the ability to be a starter and and being on a winning team? Each player is going to have a different constellation of values. So I need to have them open up and tell me how they plan to, what's critically important to them. Then um, it's preparation so that I talk with players about the fact that they're, they're playing, again, a discretionary entertainment. And if they expect to get all the largesse from it, then they're going to have to comport themselves in public in a, in a controlled way. And so you talk about drunk driving and, and staying out of fights in bars and the dangers of all sorts of things. And then how to graciously interact with uh, reporters and how to graciously interact uh, with teammates and how to handle fame and all of those issues. So we do the best we can to prepare them for the fact that if they don't want that role, then they can go play on a sandlot. But if they do, there are other parts of it that are involved that they have to uh, uh, observe. And who helps them and, with that? You know, that's a, those yeah. are all really subtle skills that all adults would like to have, right? We like to comport ourselves well in public and stay um, out of fights and bars. But uh, right. we learn those lessons in different ways, but we don't have millions of dollars riding on those decisions and mistakes. Um, no, so it's my job to prepare a player uh, as well as I can for all of that. It's also my job to prepare a player for second career so that if they'll do the charitable foundations that I talk about, if they'll retrace their roots to the high school collegiate and professional community, set up a high school scholarship fund, rebond with the alums from their school at the collegiate level, and then ultimately at the uh, pro level set up a, a charity foundation that's got the leading business people, the leading uh, politicians and community leaders from that area, then they'll, first of all, they learn how to stop being self-absorbed and how to develop other skills. And second, they bond with people throughout the community. So if you have an athlete playing for the San Francisco 49ers, well, guess what? Um, Silicon Valley and the venture capital community and the high tech community all happen to be in uh, very proximate to, to where they train. And the reality is those men are football fans too, or women. So you teach an athlete how to um, uh, go out to banquets, go to meetings, collect business cards, uh, write on the back of it exactly what the uh, person looked like or what the common interest was, compile a Rolodex, and start to cultivate relationships off the field that will help them. And you use those off seasons to, whether it's media skills or business skills, to figure out internships and other associations that that can very smoothly take someone into second career. So when I had Duran Cherry, who played safety for the Kansas City Chiefs, he had the Cherry Foundation. He had a very high profile as someone who cared about the community, and they granted him, him the Anheuser-Busch distributorship when he finished um, uh, playing, which Bud Beers in Missouri is That's a, a license to print money. That's a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> and and. So next, we happened to introduce him to Wayne Weaver, who was about to buy the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he allowed um, uh, Duran to become a, a actual minority owner at a, a you know a few years after he left pro football. Well, I'm, g- give me a little bit of um, of logistics here, right? It's I talk to um, you know I interact with young people. They ask me for advice sometimes. Uh, I help my kids try to give them ideas about what they should be doing with their lives. 
And I think most of our minds, most people, when they think about a sports agent, you know, you do the negotiation with the, you get the contract and then you go off and find another client. But you're talking about a pretty heavy load of modeling, mentoring, instructing, et cetera. How much time do you spend with those athletes day to day outside of that negotiation part, the literal business part of the endorsements, the contract? Well, that's only a minor part of the relationship. The reality is, especially in the first year or so, um, uh, a high draft pick or someone entering the sport needs a fair amount of focus. Now, it's not just me. I'll have a team around me of, uh, of uh, other folks that can answer questions and, and, and uh, provide input, but the reality is that the whole there's a whole area to, of that we call client maintenance and so if you think of agents roles it's contract negotiation client uh maintenance and uh, uh and recruiting um are are three big roles but in client maintenance it can be anything from helping someone deal with the fact that they're not starting or they're injured um, a lot of my time is spent up, spent dealing with athletic injury. It's why I became so much of a crusader on the concussion issue. Um, because, uh, players get hurt. Um, now football has the most injuries, uh, baseball, where we had a, a fairly large practice with my partner, Jeff Morad has, um, a little less. In, in in baseball, they tend to be things that happen to the body without contact, <laughs> right. pulls and and overuse of muscles in and in basketball in in football, they're contact or collision injuries, and so getting second opinions. Um, I would sit on a Sunday afternoon with a PDR, a physician's desk reference, on my um, desk. And really had to become a specialist in every joint in the human body and especially, you know, on the issue of concussion and, uh, and, and players need advice. They need second opinions. Yeah. They well, need, gonna, uh, well, let's talk about concussions in a minute. We're going to come back to that, but, uh, let me ask you a, 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 an interim question first about crises. Uh, let's take, uh, something that happens in, um, in baseball. Some report comes out linking, an athlete of yours to something unattractive, steroids, or it could be an incident in a bar or whatever. Okay. How often does <clears throat> are you the first person the athlete calls, or and how often do you read about that in the paper and think, oh my gosh, I gotta, I better get onto this. Um, it doesn't take that long because before <laughs> it's in the paper, uh, the athlete will call. Uh, hopefully, okay, so, so you reporters have some- are going to call too. So you have some lead time. Well, again, um, the incident has to happen before it, before it breaks, and many times there's a lag time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so the key to crisis control is in getting an athlete to find out all the facts that are relevant surrounding whatever it was that occurred. So when he says whatever he's going to say, he doesn't end up being contradicted later and doesn't end up making statements that push the investigatory press that we have today, the 24-hour news cycle, into, for example, in Tiger Woods, finding more women yeah. or Michael Vick, you know, finding additional dog fighting uh, problems. So one needs to be pretty clear that you've you really looked at, at whatever it was and what the consequences were. And then for athletes where there is culpability, my advice to them is to take responsibility because normally whatever the legal consequence is, um, is much less than the damage to brand and, and role modeling. So the first key is to <clears throat> come out and take responsibility and say, I, I, did whatever it was, I was wrong. Um, and the second is to state the standard that's right. So let's say it's um, fighting in a bar. I know 
that uh, being involved in in fights in public is not something I should be doing. Um, uh, and third, to state that you know you're a role model and your athlete uh, and your behavior has uh, imitative effects. Um, so I failed in that responsibility. And lastly, to apologize to all the relevant constituencies that were impacted. So. Um, you know, it may be it's the team, the franchise, the teammates, the public, the fans, um, um, whoever it might be. And lastly, to take uh, the state that you've taken steps to prevent a recurrence so that, um, you know, I'm I'm uh, going to go to alcohol classes. I'm going to do uh, counseling and anger management, whatever it is, so that people know that one is serious about the issue. But and then, every, the he, then the healing can begin. But not every athlete takes your advice, and not every one of them thinks they're going to get caught. So a lot of – I'm not talking about your clients in particular, but just in, in the sports world, we constantly see a story about, say, steroid use or – uh, misbehavior just sort of slowly spiral into you know a deeper and deeper mess. Uh, would you ever have clients who you made that speech to, and I'm sure you made it many times, uh, they ignored it because um, they're human and were hoping it would turn out, out in another way. And then you had to make a decision about how to handle that. What, what would you do in those cases? Did you ever drop a client because you couldn't <clears throat> didn't want to deal with it? Here's the key. Agents have to have the back bone and sense of responsibility to confront their clients with the real world realities and consequences of of their actions and most agents won't do it so if a player because they're afraid of getting fired so if a player i used to joke that if a player was standing on a ledge of a 90 story building and getting ready to jump He'd have 20 sycophants and his agent say, a law of gravity doesn't apply to you. You can, you, you can um, <clears throat> live out your dream. You can fly. Yeah, right. And, um, so the point is that <clears throat> no agent ever got fired, uh, for supporting the most insane activity of his client. They get fired for, <laughs> for, uh, confronting him. And so the reality is that that's my job. That's what I need to do. Someone in their life has to tell them. And most agents simply won't do it. So, yes, there have been um, uh, situations, not very many because we profile and prepare carefully, but there obviously have been situations where, depending on the circumstances, I just couldn't work with a client anymore because um, they, they, <laughs> they were not facing reality and they were not and they were being so self-destructive and um, uh, that my first impulse is always to help. And uh, But when it became clear that I simply wasn't having an impact, um, I wouldn't uh, throw a young man on the trash heap of history, but um, I'd be clear that I can only be effective where someone's listening to my advice. Well, it starts to affect your brand as well after a while. Uh, now we we talked about uh, briefly about the health issues. Football is at the National Football League's facing a particularly, uh, I think, difficult issue with the concussion issue. Uh, it could end the game, uh, and I'm curious what you think is going to happen. And would you encourage a young person today, given what we now know about the health issues? And of course, it's imperfect. We don't don't have good knowledge, but we have more knowledge than we used to have. I think. What would be your advice to a young person who was thinking of being a football player, and how do you think the NFL is going to cope with this? You know, I wrote a column this week called The Death of the NFL, in which I suggested that the uh, specter of concussion and the fact that I consider it a ticking time bomb and really an undiagnosed health epidemic because – we really only deal with those people who are knocked out lying on the field. The reality is low-level concussive events occur all the time. Matter of fact, the simple act of an offensive and defensive lineman hitting together at the beginning of every play yeah. uh, creates a low-level concussive event. Now, a player theoretically playing high school, college, and professional football and 70 offensive plays for uh, a game 
uh, could retire having had 10,000 low-level concussive hits, none of which got registered as a concussion. So what makes this issue different is that it's one thing to know because of aches and pains to different joints being broken down, an athlete will have a difficult time reaching over to pick up their child when they turn 40. It's a quite another matter to not be able to identify that child because of dementia and other uh, symptomatology. So I became so disturbed with this back in the 90s that I started to hold concussion and player safety seminars and brought the leading neurologist around so they could answer the question, how many are too many, which they didn't answer. And um, so we held that first series and asked that the head and neck be taken out of blocking and tackling. There would be a neurologist on the sideline, issued a white paper, not much changed. And uh, then uh, starting in 2006, did another series with the Concussion Institute where um, we got neurologists finally who had done the studies and said that three or more appeared to be the magic number. And after that, the um, there was an exponential rise in the risk of Alzheimer's, premature senility, ALS, Parkinson's, and elevated rates of depression, and then the worst syndrome, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So at that point, we raised the alarm. The NFL finally convened the physician's conference, then later adopted uh, baseline testing. But the reality of this is that <sighs> Given the size, weight, and strength of players, uh, which is dramatically changed from when I began uh, back in 1975, the, these hits are going to occur. And um, you will start to have parents, as Tom Brady's father did, say, you know, I wouldn't let my son play football. And second of all, you've got a series of lawsuits um, with players who, as recently as 1994, Dr. Elliot Pellman said that, who was the team, uh, the league physician, said that there is no problem that we've been able to to find with uh, long-term concussion effects. Uh, one doesn't seem to have much to do with another, nor does, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, does does uh, the fact that you have them close together seem to indicate much well <laughs> so how, how could players assume the risk of the sport if they didn't even know what concussions would do and were told by the league not to worry about them yeah so that lawsuit threatens the basic foundation um where it's going to affect not only an award but insurance rates and and future problems and everything else if we don't take drastic action well and it's going to take some of the fun out of watching it, right? It's one thing to enjoy a, a great tackle that both players at least get up off the ground. But if you know that 20 years later, they're likely to be unable to recognize their child, um, even for fans who like violence and enjoy the gladiator aspect of the sport, it, it, I think it's going to, it's not going to be so much fun. I, obviously there's a culture in the, in a lot of sports that says, and you hear it constantly on, you know, talk shows. Uh, I know the risk. It's a man's game. It's not a kid's game. It's uh, – and we understand the risks and we choose it knowing that there's a risk of this. And some people will, literally will, I think, because – Well, well some- that is yeah, – that's true when it comes to understanding that there's going to be pain in the knee and back and and uh, ankle and, and hip. It – this is the first time – that it's been crystal clear the last few years to players that that in, in the wake of the deaths of Junior Sale and, yeah. and Dave Dewerson, what the real consequences can be. So um, we're now about to see what the reaction is. Look, anybody who says things like what are they going to do? Put a dress on the quarterback? Right. Uh, you, you know, it's a man's game and all that. You know, they, what are you, their quarterbacks are becoming wusses. I challenge them to go out onto a collegiate or professional practice field 
and take one hit, <laughs> one direct hit, and uh. and see if they're able to get out of bed uh, the next morning without assistance. I mean, you have no idea the automobile accident and train wreck that ensues on every play. Um, uh, 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 as much sound as they do on football, we're completely screened off from just the basic, incredible wow. force. I've stood on those sidelines and, um, uh, and yet, I couldn't uh, stop my two high school sons from playing football. They played. Yeah. Uh, well, I always think about it when I look at the – it's ironic because I think you get the best feel for the violence of the game after the game's over. And you see these people who've been – it looks like they're trying to hurt each other. Most of the time they're not, but they're, they are doing violent things to each other. And after the game's over, they uh, they embrace and they um, there's a camaraderie there that's, um, for me, quite – quite moving yeah the camaraderie you allude to is one of the reasons that a sport like football is so attractive it it creates a bonding that very few things in the society do but the thing that people don't see is that when i gave the presenting speech for warren moon as he entered the hall of fame in canton in 2006 they allowed the presenters to go to <clears throat> a private luncheon with with all the uh, living members of the Hall of Fame. And if you watch them move and walk, it's appalling. Um, they have a raised stage um, that some of the festivities are done on. And to watch some of those retired athletes try to climb the stage was uh, agonizing. That's heartbreaking. And so you, what you're not seeing is how every joint in the human body gets broken down and how they have to live with that later. When I see them after the game uh, I, and I, you know, you hear sports fans run their mouths on talk shows and, and on the Internet and uh, we, those of us outside the game have no idea what it's really like on a Sunday when you're in pain and you're playing with pain and you're getting banged up. It's um, – it's and an incredible... remember, those those athletes are um, have the adrenaline still flowing in them when you're seeing them post game or during the game, and they're not feeling it yet. The next morning, they feel it. Let me ask you a, a question about uh, negotiation and and what it's like to um, be on the same page as as your client. Uh, we're we're taping this. Um, February 2013, I think it was today or yesterday, Tom Brady announced the new contract for the New England Patriots. And he's taking something of a pay cut or at least not taking the maximum that he might get. And, of course, there are a lot of other people affected by that. He, he did this supposedly to help create more flexibility for the team in hiring and signing future players. And he's, he has an image as a winner. Uh, and, and the public story that's come out of this is that you know, Brady's interested in winning and not just the bottom line of his maximizing his salary, which could be true. Uh, it's not that we don't, we don't, none of us care only about money. But of course, when he does that, he affects other quarterbacks negotiating some claim. He certainly affects what his agent takes home. And I'm curious, this issue comes up often with the so called hometown discount. A player becomes a free agent. The fans all think, oh, yeah, he'll take a pay cut to, to stay in St. Louis, just to pick a player my kids were big fans of, Albert Pujols, you know, people thought he'll stay in St. Louis. He likes it there. He doesn't need to be the – what's the difference between X million and X plus one million? But often players want the highest salary. Sometimes they don't. I'm curious how you deal with that as an agent and when it affects you. Well, first of all, let me, let me guarantee you that players don't quantify money in the same way that you and I do. They're not looking at an extra fifty thousand dollars or or million dollars in terms of what it can buy. Um, they're not thinking, "Oh my goodness, if I could only get this, I could have another Winnebago." Another and I could put, <laughs> Yeah, and I could put. They don't look at it like that. They're primarily focused with what similarly situated players are making, it's pride. and it's a mark of mark of pride. Yeah, sure. They're so far they're beyond. Score. They are so far beyond the ability to even spend all the money they're getting that that that's not their consideration. As it uh, goes to Tom Brady, um, 
Tom Brady has one obligation, to do what's right for himself under the circumstance and to use his own value system, of which a value is the fact that he plays a team game, he needs a big offensive line to block for him, he needs well-paid uh, skill position players, and he needs to to do what's left for him because he's well beyond living on any money he'll make. He's already wealthy for life. And, and that's to, to win. Um, and make no mistake, <clears throat> those restructuring contracts in football have a definite benefit for the player because what he's doing is trading salary all of which counts against the current cap for signing bonus or guaranteed money, which gets amortized over the life of the contract. So if you take a contract that has a $50 million signing bonus and it extends for five years, then $10 million a year counts against the cap under that formula. The whole salary counts against the cap. So it's ridiculous for a player who doesn't care because money is money and guarantee is better in a sport with a high risk of career ending injury. So what Tom Brady's getting out of that is much more guaranteed money in exchange for something he doesn't care about, which is whether it's classified as salary or bonus and uh making a rational choice um the difference between tom brady making the super bowl and any other player is millions of dollars in endorsements for sure it's quantifiable because the quarterback who's mvp uh is going to be the biggest beneficiary watch how joe flacco's life changes now um and what he's able to do because of playing on that center stage so um and, and as for other agents and players um <laughs> one would simply distinguish the fact that tom brady is negotiating with the patriots at a certain point in his career using his own priorities and that um, another player needs to be treated individually as uh, uh, regards what his market is and and what his situation is. Let me, so, ask, you, let me ask you another question. I, mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, that's why I, I put a little question mark after that part of it because I think people like to talk about that. I'm not sure how important it is. But uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots are famous for uh, not saying the wrong thing. Uh, Brady always says the right thing. He's an exemplar in terms of the issues you've been talking about respect to what he says in public, how he handles himself. Uh, a few years back, he had a very mediocre receiving core, and I'm sure that bothered him. Uh, I'm curious, given your knowledge of the game, in situations like that, does a quarterback – he never complained publicly, ever, that he had second and third-tier receivers, as far as I know. Did he complain to his coach? Did he – Did was his coach – Comforting him, saying, "Don't worry, we'll get you some better in a year," which they did. They got him Randy Moss and Wes Welker, and he got. See, a better- that's the difference between public and private. Because in reality, <clears throat> he didn't even have to complain. <clears throat> the coaches are looking at every bit of game film. Yeah, they knew. They, <laughs> they the know. Um, it, it's not a secret. But I'll tell you what's key is that leadership role, knowing that the quarterback will always protect his teammates publicly. It's part of what inspires people to follow a leader, you know, into hell and beyond on a football field. Yeah, for sure. And so the writers sitting in a press box know that the pass was good and it was dropped. Um, if a quarterback comes out and says that, he's going to undercut his relationship with the, with the wide receivers and everybody else. So that, um, quite commonly I would talk to, uh, uh, teams about enhancing the cast around the player. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but those were never public discussions. Any athletes you particularly admire? Any general managers, uh, 
your peers in the agent business? You don't have to tell me the ones you don't like, but um, <clears throat> and you probably wouldn't. But are there anybody that particularly stands out as people you respect? Well, first of all, the the key is ownership in sports. So you take an owner like Robert Kraft, who <clears throat> when he bought the team, I had Drew Bledsoe as a client, and I watched Bob very carefully ask questions of everyone around him as to what constituted the best general manager, what constituted the right structure for an organization, the fundamentals of scouting. Instead of just coming and imposing his will, he researched every morsel he could get on how to build a winning organization and took his own intuition and and built a structure <coughs> that will always win. Um, and understood the importance of uh, the coach and the general manager. Now, the organization is critically important. It's why the same organizations win, even though the draft and free agency are designed to break them down. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They win anyway. The Pittsburgh Steelers find a formula uh, historically to win because they've got stability. They've got the Roonies as owners who understand uh, the long term. Um and uh, someone like Bob uh, Kraft will win. It's why for years in a sport like um, baseball, um, I mean, George Steinbrenner and his group, for all their, um, uh, uh, for all the, the focus that was put on them, uh, they actually produce winning teams. And uh, for years, the O'Malley family with the Dodgers produced winning teams. And Artie Marino is the type of owner who will do that. At the coaching level, um, you take a coach in pro football like uh, Bill Belichick or you take um, uh, those coaches uniquely understand how to win. And they, they will take the same group of players and make them better. And they have an inherent sense for what, for what, um, makes, um, uh, things work. Um, in terms of agency, there are many, many well-meaning agents who really care about their clients. Um, but there are far too many agents who think their job is to just put more dollars in the bank book of the player. And they don't think about the player's reputation, the health of the sport, um, the fact that this contract negotiation is not about me. <laughs> it's about the player and the team. And my role is to facilitate that. But I'm not a, uh, uh, my role should never, uh, be such that it becomes a distraction in that. And, um, so, um, the that problem. Doesn't always, it doesn't always turn out that way in your business. Well, the problem with agentry is there's so little collegiality in it that most agents can simply not um, operate as peers. So you get a best-selling author, and he'll write squibs for other best-selling authors' books, even though they're competition. You get a doctor, and they will tell you that someone else has done a splendid piece of uh, work or is an innovator in the field. It's almost unique to agentry like a uh, barrel of crabs that agents uh, seem to uh, be constitutionally incapable of that. And so the whole process around agentry is very akin to the Republican uh, primary where instead of the candidates emphasizing their own skills, they spent time denigrating other people's. Um, I didn't want my wife to marry me when I was married, because I convinced her that all of the men were horrible, <laughs> you know. So, so that's the point. So, do you and, want to say this uh, is your? We're almost out of time. Do you want to say something nice about another agent? This is your chance. Oh, there are a slew of of, uh, of agents that I've liked and respected over time. I think that David Falk. Um, uh, did a very good job for his clients, was very innovative um, in terms of how he worked with uh, Michael Jordan. I think in in football, some of the less well-known agents, whether they're uh, Jack Mills or Tony Agnone or the Tolners, or there's a whole series of, of really 
uh, decent people in it. Um, the problem is, is that many of the industry leaders, um, base their whole thing on negativity. And, um, uh, and, and that's sort of, uh, that's sort of difficult. But, um, um, I used to send notes to other agents complimenting them on great contracts. <clears throat> and then my partner sent a note to another agent complimenting him on a great uh, contract and a player said that he featured the other agent featured that in his recruiting book. <laughs> <laughs> my guest today has been Lee Steinberg. Lee, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's been my pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.